A long time ago, the Ultra series had fighting games. It's kind of weird to think about. It's a franchise dedicated to the concept of a giant silver guy fighting monsters. Where are the modern input-based 1v1 style fighting games? Sure, we've been getting games with fighting in them, but they're not traditional in the usual sense of the genre, being based more around turn-based strategy or cards. No, I'm talking about the ones where you'd do a quarter circle and shoot a fireball. Though in this case I guess it would be knocking someone down and holding R1. Yes, the Ultraman Fighting Evolution series lasted five entries, all spanning across three PlayStation consoles. Today, I want to take a look at this series to see if it still holds up and what changed across all five titles. An important thing to keep in mind, I'm bad at fighting games. I'm not keen on nuances like combos or juggling or being good, but I get a warm fuzzy feeling when I can pull off a shoryuken. Every fighting game series has to start somewhere. As stupidly obvious as that statement is, God, I can't believe I wrote that. And that somewhere starts with Ultraman Fighting Evolution 1, released for the first PlayStation in 1998. At first glance, the game doesn't look too bad for the PS1. The character models look quite good, and the environments are alright. Music is pulled from all over the original Showa-era run of Ultraman, and it's all decent MIDI renditions of familiar songs. They're all a little dopey sounding here, sure, but they've got charm. My favorite track has to be the rendition of the Ultraman Taro theme, which is sped up to such a degree it sounds like the backing track to a Cossack dance. Curiously, the entire game is in English. I'd imagine a Western localization would have been fairly cheap. You win! I consider the character selection here inoffensive. We don't have any crazy picks. The roster of kaiju and aliens originated largely from Ultraman and Ultra 7. The most unique character here is probably Alien Metron, just because this is the only fighting evolution game where he's a playable character. There are four extra unlockable characters, so the roster does eventually grow in size. Surprisingly, the roster doesn't feature newer Ultras like Tiga or Dinah whose shows started around the time the game was released. You'd think they'd try to have some marketing synergy. I suppose they wanted to stick with the guaranteed favorites. Ultraman, Ultra 7, and Taro were safe picks. There are some bog standard modes here. There's a versus mode, training, options, an arcade mode which pits you against consecutive opponents, and a survival mode which is essentially a harder version of the arcade mode where you only get one life. The game doesn't have a lot to offer in terms of replay value, aside from unlocking other characters. This is all there is to it. It doesn't help that it just doesn't feel good to control. There's a light attack, a heavy attack, a jump. If you've ever played a fighting game, it's all here. What makes this one weird is that there's a dedicated block button, and tapping the X button lets you sidestep. That's cool, it adds a third dimension to the fights and lets you dodge beam attacks. But I think later games took better advantage of the 3D arenas with all the buildings and objects you could smash into. You don't get a lot of that here. The controls are less responsive than I hoped. If there is something this and the next two games are going to share, it's that combo potential is rudimentary. And while the next two sequels at least have moves that feel good to land, the first game here feels a lot sloppier. It feels like there's a slight delay to everything, and jumping feels way too floaty. Unlike later entries, special moves are executed more like a contemporary fighter at the time. Inputting button combinations lets the player spit a laser beam whenever they want. These are still a gamble because it takes a while for the character to stop doing their little dance for it to come out, which gives the opponent plenty of time to get out of the way or counterattack. There's no beam clashing in this game either, so whoever has a beam with more priority wins. You lose. Fighting Evolution 1 just doesn't feel good to play. I think some aspects of its presentation are enjoyable, but it's really just another mediocre 3D fighting game made in the wake of Tekken and Virtua Fighter, with not much beyond franchise appeal keeping me coming back. 
The second game is a huge step forward, however. Ultraman Fighting Evolution 2. I guess it is worth mentioning that there was a game released in between the two titled Tiga and Dina Fighting Evolution New Generation, but it's going for a completely different gameplay style. It also looks awful, and there's only so much pain I can endure for a video. Anyways, Fighting Evolution 2. Released in 2002, FE2 was the series' leap to, well, the PlayStation 2. Being on a new generation of consoles, there's clearly an improvement in graphical fidelity. Here, the series introduces a new mode, a selection of missions where you play through a few key scenes from the Ultra series. There are sadly only three levels here. It feels unfinished. There's a level based on the Gomera episode from the original Ultraman, one based on the King Joe episode from Ultra 7, and an entirely original mission where the Ultra Gang has to fend off alien invaders, which ends in a pretty fun final segment where you fight Zeton with all the Ultra Brothers. The music from the first game makes a return here too, in addition to new tracks for the new characters. It all still sounds a bit dopey. Jack's music especially sounds like circus music. Every officially inducted Ultra Brother is here. AD missed the memo, I guess. Some of the renders look a little off. Jack's neck here is melting into his face, but generally everyone looks how they're supposed to. There's even a couple unlockable characters here too, with Zeton being suitably broken. The gameplay has seen some important tweaks. You can now sidestep by double tapping up or down. There's now a dedicated grab button. And there are light attacks that have variations by tapping different directions, as well as heavy staggering attacks. You can't spam special attacks anymore. You have to add to a bar below the opponent's health. The higher it is when you hit them with a staggering attack, the stronger the special move you can execute after holding R1 and L1. Most importantly, in a design choice possibly lifted from those awful Super Nintendo games, the opponent must be finished off with a special move. I like how it's executed here though. It can be any level of special move you want, and it does a better job at emulating the conclusions to the fights from the show. Even so, the controls aren't quite there yet. They still feel a little stiff, but they're for sure an improvement over the first game. I actually feel like I have control over my character here. I can execute the moves I want without praying first. It's decent. Stages have hazards in the form of attack vehicles now, and there appears to be some PNG that appears above your fighter's head every now and again, but whatever effect it has is barely noticeable. The only time it ever affected a match for me was when it flipped the visuals. The dastardly work of Yapul for sure. Oh, and this game introduces some building destruction too. They don't do extra damage, it's just a fun detail. <laughs> Fighting Evolution 2 is not a bad game, but it's brimming with potential that isn't quite there yet. With a little more fine-tuning on the combat, a little more replayability to unlock more characters and flashier special moves, it could be better. This game was laying the groundwork for a better one. Ultraman Fighting Evolution 3. Yeah, that one. FE3 is everything FE2 was, but thicker. More characters, more moves, more modes, and more tweaks to the gameplay. Evolution 3 has plenty of modes to choose from, the first being a much more fleshed out version of the missions from Evolution 2, with ones here being based on each Ultra's respective show, and then there's the mission that looks like any other one, but then it's revealed to be what might as well be a new item on the main menu, the Invasion Mode. It's like an expanded version of the third mission in the second game, but here you pick an Ultra and have them travel across Japan to fend off aliens, and it has a sort of strategy element to it. There's so much more replay value in this game. Tag teams, the returning arcade gauntlet, the story missions, friggin' Dada Mode where you capture monsters to use against Ultraman, and to top it all off, Ultraman Jack's victory track still sounds like circus music.
monsters now explode when you hit them with a special move at the end of a match. The Ultramen don't. I guess they didn't want to traumatize any kids seeing their favorite Ultra guy being reduced to pieces. Not that it stopped them before, but you know. The game's roster is beefy. Every major Ultra is represented here, along with a couple minor ones. Except Powered. And Great. And Naos. Fuck you, Zayarth. Every character has a little intro animation, and every Ultra gets an FMV recreating their Rise sequence. It's a little detail, but it helps. Sure, there are some filler characters here, like Delusion Ultra 7 and Fake Dinah, but this is, overall, a decent roster. One of my biggest gripes with the game is the process for unlocking certain characters. Yes, characters like Zafi are supposed to be bonuses for going the extra mile, also, I don't really care about Zafi, and unlocking him is just for bragging rights. But the process for unlocking Ultraman 80 is so hilariously obscure. I can't remember how because it's been so long, but I think it involved A-ranking every mission, then beating the alien invasion mode with every Ultra, then doing the same with the arcade mode, maybe? I can't remember how I unlocked him, but it was ridiculous. Poor 80 got relegated to being a super secret guest character, but hey, he's here. Trump! The gameplay is largely the same from FE2, but with some improvements. Grabbing attacks are automated now. The triangle button is used for stronger attacks now instead of being conspicuously unused. And you can do jumping and running staggering attacks. Special moves can be selected with a button when you have the stagger gauge high enough, and beams can now be blocked and sometimes absorbed by pressing the corresponding button when prompted. Special attacks are customizable too, with many of them being fun little references to iconic moves from the series. By completing every character's arcade and invasion mode, you can get new moves. The only ones you get this option are the Ultramen though, so the monsters are at an inherent disadvantage and it does lead to some balancing issues. They're still viable, I just would have liked to see what they would have come up with for Balton. Zetan is still horribly broken at least. <laughs> Let's not get it twisted, Evolution 3 is not getting shown at EVO anytime soon. Not with the number of broken characters and lack of combo potential, beyond really simple stuff. And yeah, some of the missions are a little too hard for their own good, and every time you finish a mode or story mission it boots you back to the menu and you hear Ultraman, Fighting Evolution 3. Every single time. But for an Ultraman fan, it's got everything I want. A huge roster of characters represented by their iconic theme music, a lot of fun modes that take as much advantage of the source material as they reasonably can, and the most polished, as polished as it can be anyways, combat systems seen in an Ultraman fighting game yet. If there's one takeaway from this video, it's that you need to play Fighting Evolution 3. To date, I think it's one of the best Ultraman games ever made. So, how did they follow it up? Ultraman Fighting Evolution Reverse. Released in 2005, once again for the PS2, Fighting Evolution Rebirth takes the most drastic departure in terms of gameplay and presentation. The visuals are darker, familiar kaiju are given radical redesigns, the story mode is completely overhauled and is more or less the central focus of the game. And unlike FE2 and 3, which were good, this one is, uh... well, okay, it's not awful, but I think they dropped the ball here. Visually speaking, the game is going for something... grittier. The Ultramen are more anatomically correct with visible muscles, the skies are almost always overcast, and the color palette in general is more desaturated. As to why they did this, I mean, I suppose Nexus was airing as Rebirth was in development. So they may have been trying to capture something similar, but with the game's visuals rather than theming. I don't know. Project N wasn't very popular, so it could just be a coincidence. I do like the look. It gives Rebirth a different personality from the rest. Another positive is the game's soundtrack. Whilst other Fighting Evolution games do straight covers of Ultraman music, this one remixes a couple tracks to represent the returning characters, and they sound pretty good. Uh, 
Unfortunately, a lot of cuts were made to the roster from the last game, with only three returning Showa Ultramen and four Heisei ones. Damn shame, especially since the roster is padded with superfluous Dark Ultramen too. We've got some unique picks here, like Geronimon and Mephilus and Bolton, and I do like the EX Kaiju. EX, Eliking, and Tyrant are designs that would be hard to pull off with practical effects, so that's what makes the medium of video games so potentially interesting for Ultraman. It's not one confined by live action or needing to be modeled after a humanoid posture. Rebirth sees the most robust story mode in the whole series. It's structured around a branching path with episodes where a monster battle plays out. The nuances of the story are totally lost on me considering it's in Japanese, but from what I can parse, it follows an alien invasion, and the usual batch of goobers are given upgrades in the form of EX forms. And that's my biggest takeaway. I didn't know Gomera and Red King's EX forms originated from this game. I thought those were mega monster battle creations. So that was neat to discover. The story mode is genuinely one of the best aspects of the game. There's not a lot wrong with how the story progression works. I guess the one minigame it forced me to do was kinda crap, but that's true for the last game too. That and the game forces you to do every mission to progress, even though it gives you the option to go down another path. That aside, I like how they made something original with familiar iconography. The story has plenty of decent looking FMVs too, even if they skimp out with a text crawl sometimes. The problem is the thing that actually happens within the story. The gameplay. The combat of Rebirth also sees a radical departure from the previous games. There are still light and heavy attacks, but now the circle button can be charged to do more damage. Initiating special moves is now done by building up a meter from either attacking or holding R1. The stagger meter returns here, now represented by a tiny flashing bar, and staggering opponents allows for dedicated special charging time. If two charged attacks collide, a brief struggle occurs where you have to mash the circle button more than the opponent. The weight of Fighting Evolution 3 is gone. The cast of Rebirth throws punches and kicks much faster than they did before. You would think this would make actual combos possible, and yeah, there is a bit more of that here. But it doesn't feel right. It's hard to explain. Jump attacks are more finicky to pull off for some reason. I'm unsure if my attacks are gonna land half the time. The consequences are a game that feels a lot more jittery and unsatisfying to play. It doesn't feel good. Inversely to the fast-as-hell hand-to-hand combat, the special attack animations are far too sluggish, creating a stark and uncomfortable contrast where the flow of the game is constantly speeding up and slowing down. Credit where it's due, these animations are really cool. The power behind the strongest attacks is conveyed phenomenally well, with dramatic camera angles and strong posing. As someone with an interest in filmmaking, I love this kind of cinematic flair. But there is a pretty bad trade-off here that doesn't make the added spectacle worth it, in my opinion. Obviously, in this subjective review. As cool as these special attack animations are, the game kinda just stops when they happen. It's not a quick two to five second diversion like in the prior games, no. These can go on for as long as 10 to 20 seconds. The fight always grinds to a halt for these, and they just get tiring to watch over and over again. Yes, this is a spectacle fighter intended for fan service, but the gameplay experience here suffers from the repeated interruptions of the special attack animations. They're so goddamn long that I had enough time to write this sentence in the time it took for one of them to end. For fuck's sake, I get it. I'm about to lose a lot of health. Can we please move on already? Finally. It would be fine if the long animations were saved for the finishers, but even something as bog-standard as Ella King's mouth beams takes so long to show. Can't skip the special attack animations, can't skip the cutscenes, but the combat moves a hundred miles an hour. It's an uneven experience. And that's what kills Rebirth for me. The presentation is cool, but I absolutely cannot stand the gameplay. They were going for something different, and it really didn't work for me. It felt less like a rebirth, and more like a regression. I'm glad it wasn't the last game of the series, because I think Fighting Evolution Zero is a step up. 
released on the PlayStation Portable in 2006, Fighting Evolution Zero is more explicitly a tie-in game with the first Mebius movie, so it sees a significantly shrunken roster that places greater emphasis on the Showa era. A lot of what's here has been lifted from the console titles, but obviously parred down a little for a portable console. There's definitely less tangible content, and the gameplay has been simplified a little, but everything still looks and sounds the part of a fighting evolution game. Just don't look at the buildings too closely. Also, the sound mixing on the color timers is more grating here. And for what it's worth, the game has the best MIDI renditions of all the represented Ultraman themes. There were, once again, some cuts made to the roster. With the exception of Mebius, every other Heisei Ultra has sadly been excluded. Almost every Showa Ultra is here as well, but I guess AD missed the invitation again. You start with every Ultraman available, but the monster cast must be unlocked through the story mode. I got through it once and unlocked them all, so I guess it's not as much of a pain to unlock everyone as it was for Evolution 3. While this game does not feature a legacy mode like Evolution 3, it does have a short story mode. It's presented through these PNG cutscenes, and obviously the nuances of it are totally lost on me. But the gist of it is that alien Yapool is going around and taking powers from various kaiju and Ultramen, and it's up to your Ultra of choice to stop them. Every character goes through the same story. The only one who doesn't is Mebius, but his scenario is undercooked. It's essentially a training gauntlet, and it's over in 30 minutes. And at least 10 of those minutes is spent fighting Taro on three separate occasions. It's a fighting game story. It all exists as an excuse to set up the next fight scene. It's simple, and that's fine. Not understanding the language does make following wind conditions pretty confusing, so there is a mild language barrier. There are also segments here that exist simply to waste time. There are two whole segments in the story mode dedicated to fighting five Ultramen. It's all just there to pad out the story. Thankfully, the game takes more from FE2 and 3 than Rebirth, but the speed at which the characters attack is noticeably cranked up, so they lack the same heft. You still have to get the opponent's health down and finish them with a special move, but in this game they're executed more traditionally. You have a meter that goes up over the course of the fight, and inputting the circle button with a corresponding direction gives you a different attack of varying strength. All require a certain amount of energy to pull off. The stronger the attack, the more energy you need. It's simple. I do like how snappy Zero's gameplay is. It's so much faster that the developers implemented a combo count. But because it's faster, it's also a little more punishing. Taro's punching strings can get ridiculous. You also have the potential to dish out some good combos, so you can be just as capable as the AI in that regard. It's just a bit of a learning curve. What is undeniably terrible is that the game's arenas are much smaller than they are in the previous games, so I often found myself sidestepping into an invisible wall instead of out of harm's way. And because the camera is positioned closer to the action and at a lower angle, it's hard to see where you are on the stage, so that's annoying. Animations during some special attacks can last a little too long, but luckily not as long as they did in Rebirth, god no. This can get problematic because for certain attacks, the timer doesn't stop ticking down when you start, which means that you can get a time over in the middle of a special move that would otherwise win the match. That happened to me at least once here. That and characters like Alien Hipparito have instant kill moves, and, you know, they seem easy to avoid, but that's easier said than done. What could be considered a gimmick in this game is the use of spirits, kinda like the PNGs that randomly appeared during the battles in the second game. In the versus mode, you can equip your character with a monster or hero spirit, which grants them a minor buff when activated. Using these feels like cheating, and you can't even turn them off. In battle mode, which is more or less the arcade mode, you gain points that are used in a gallery mode to unlock character bios and the aforementioned spirits. After unlocking all the characters in the story mode, this is pretty much the only replay value the game has. In fairness, they use this as an opportunity to make some pretty big deep cuts. I don't think any other Ultraman game I've played has a reference to the one witch alien from Taro that put Kotaro in a bean. 
For the handheld it was made for, and especially for the time it was made, Fighting Evolution Zero is pretty alright. It's got some annoyances in the gameplay, I still prefer how heavy the characters felt in FE3, but it supplies a decent amount of Ultraman action on the go. I would be more disappointed if it was an actual console game, but for the amount of content it provides and the quality of it, yeah, it works pretty well for what it is. Though it could have benefited from more development time, because it seems like something that was rushed out to be a tie-in with a movie. It's good for an afternoon. And that's the last we saw of the Fighting Evolution series. A darn shame it couldn't end more spectacularly. Not to imply that the games we've been getting are bad, I quite enjoyed the Kaiju Monster Rancher game they put out recently. I just think fan service -y fighting games like the Fighting Evolution series are the best format for Ultraman games. What makes its absence all the more disappointing these days is that so many more Ultramen have debuted since they stopped making them. Imagine what a modern Fighting Evolution game would look like, with a mix of new and old representatives. Though, if I could be cynical for a second, the Ultraman roster would probably be incomplete at first, and then they'd add the rest through paid DLC. Oh, worse yet, the game undersells and they don't even do DLC, and the game's legacy is that of an incomplete project, with a small but passionate player base that cherishes it for decades. But still, it's fun to wonder, what if we had nice things? Cynicism aside, I do hope we get another crack at the series. Friggin' Budokai Tenkaichi 4 got announced after years of unrelated fighting games. The Ultraman fanbase is less vocal and rabid than Dragon Ball's, but hey, it's no longer inconceivable for an old fighting game series to suddenly be resurrected. It's just highly unlikely. And with Tsuburaya attempting another international push, a new fighting game with a worldwide release would be a nice peace offering. Here's to hoping we get another great Ultraman fighting evolution game. Thanks for watching. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. This one was a little more fun to make because I got to play some video games. But yeah, here is a shout out to the patrons who helped make videos like this one possible. JCS, Mulan Nguyen, Ultraman Taro vs. Leo, Heyam Mooney, Krazak53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, Radiant GV, Chronicler Waba, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avok Robot, The Antagonist, Richard Ciavardon, Ziggy Zigra, It's God Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you very much.